misunderstanding. And from all enmity and strife we're free. No unkind words to wound our hearts are spoken. Oh, this is just what heaven means to me. What will it be when we get over yonder and join the throng upon the glassy sea? We'll join our loved ones and crown Christ forever. Oh, this is just what heaven means to me. Oh, this is just what heaven means to me. You know, we sang this song, What Heaven Means to Me. And I would like to ask us a question this morning. What does Jesus mean to you? What does he mean to me? Luke chapter 18. There was one time a blind man sitting by the wayside begging. And... He couldn't understand what was going on. You see, he was blind. He, he couldn't see. Today, I wonder sometimes how many, how often do I have eyes, but I can't see the spiritual. I can't, I can't quite get it. I can't quite see. And, and it says here, and it came to pass that as he was come nigh unto Jericho, a certain blind man sat by the wayside begging. Ever felt like you were by the wayside? Like, others got it, but I'm, at the, I'm on the wayside. I, I feel like I just ain't quite getting it. I, I just, I'm not with the crowd. I'm not in, you know, or others might, I don't know. I think, it, I think it's kind of natural maybe for, for us to sometimes feel that, but we shouldn't. I'm just, see, this morning, I, I want to just talk to you. I just want to talk to us here. I'm not going to come up here and just preach a sermon. It's not just a sermon. I'm talking to, I hope you can feel that I'm, I'm talking to uh, my brothers and sisters. You know what I'm saying? We're just talking this morning. And that's why I think we're allowed to, we're allowed to say that, uh, we're allowed to recognize that sometimes we feel like we're on the sideline, on the wave, on the, you know, we're allowed to recognize that and just, you know, and, but, but there's an answer this morning. Even if we feel all this, there's an answer. And hearing the multitude pass by, he asked what it meant. And they told him that Jesus of Nazareth is passing by. And he cried out, saying, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. Ever, ever, ever been there? Can you, can you make this chapter, can you make this blind man, can, can you, do you remember? I guess that's, what does Jesus mean to you? If we can remember how he felt and where he was and, and uh, by the wayside begging and, and, and knowing that Jesus is there, but he couldn't understand what it meant, then this chapter can mean something to each of us, if we can make it personal. And he cried out, saying, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. And they which went before him rebuked him that he should hold his peace but he cried out so much the more, thou son of David, have mercy on me. I remember when I felt like this. I knew there had to be a truth. I knew that there had to be something because I could read it in the Bible, but <clears throat> I don't know. I was in the wayside begging. and I, But I was begging to Jesus. I was begging to God, and then I would ask people at times, what does this mean or that mean? And instead of answering, they told me to shut up. Just be quiet, you know, you just make a ruckus. You just make issues, you just make problems. It's better if we just do what we've always done. But brothers and sisters, it's better if we seek and hunger after righteousness. We have to be, it says, thirst after and hunger after righteousness. I heard a preacher say, not after chocolate chip cookies, but righteousness. How about right now, you know, that much. But but, you know, he, he cried out the more. If, if, somebody, if, if somebody's in here searching and you would like to know Jesus, I'm going to tell you, unfortunately, people are not your best friend. 
I'll just tell you this. I'm not saying, you know, you, we should be able to talk to people. But as a whole, guess where we should go if we want help? The people here told him, be quiet. They rebuked him. And he wanted, he wanted Jesus to have mercy on him. I, I, can you, can you, I cannot imagine <clears throat> the turmoil that was going on inside of him. He needed something, and they tell him, they rebuke him instead. That was me at one time, and I don't know if I don't know if you can if you, if that was your story or not. And but but be, even when they told him to be quiet, he did it so much the more. There's your key. There's there is a there's one answer is no matter what tell, people tell you, no matter what happens, cry out the more. Hunger after it. Bring it, Thurno. I don't know. I mean, I, it's important. Because our whole destiny, the whole eternity hangs on it. And Jesus stood. Oh, I love this, this verse. And it says, and Jesus stood and commanded him to be brought unto him. I'm telling you, one time this happened to me. One time this happened to me when I was told to be quiet. When I was told to just, you know, be quiet. Jesus stopped on my behalf. And he stopped on your behalf. And he said, come here. All you that labor and are heavily laden. If you're, if you're hurting, if you're laboring, if you're heavy laden, you know what? Jesus will stop for you. And he says, come here. And when he was come near, he asked him. Listen, what, what, what Jesus asked him, he asked from everybody here. When God made Adam in the garden, he took a clump of dirt and he made Adam. But he was dead and he had nothing there. He, made, he created the man and, and it was as dead before him. And then he breathed in his nostril and a living soul. A soul that will never go to nothing. So Adam was nothing without the soul. When that soul came, when, when he created that man, he had a need. Not at that point. He didn't have a need. But he was fully, completely in tune with God. But when he created Adam, he created a man in the image of God. And in the image of God created he him. He was complete and perfect. But then when sin came into the garden, the devil came. And, he, and you know, God said, don't eat. He said, you can eat from every tree but a, except the one tree. And guess what? Exactly what they wasn't supposed to do is exactly what happened. And you know the whole story. And the perfect relationship that they had in the garden. That perfect tune with God. That thing that he did. They, well, he, Adam wasn't blind at this point. He wasn't blind and sitting by the wayside feeling inferior from anybody else. He was perfect. God had a relationship. It says he came and walked with him and he talked with him. And, 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 and he had, it was good. God said it is sehr good, right? I can't, I don't even know what that says. Very good, I guess. It was very good. Then, but then sin came down, and because of sin relationship that was perfect became separated. And because it was separated, they had to get out of the garden. And you know the whole story, they were out of the garden, and, and, and now, now he had to, now, now he was hungry. Now he had to, he, he had, he had issues. Adam now needed, needed something. And if God would have, and, and, and I think Adam had the same heart that I had and that probably most of you had, is when we come and when we finally break and we finally get Jesus to stop. We finally get him to say, come here. And then Jesus asks a question. What wilt thou that I should do unto thee? What do you want? After all life, after all that is done here, what do you want? Jesus talking to that soul that he breathed in Adam, and he talks to me, and he says, what do you want that I should do? Can somebody tell me what he said he wants? What, he, what, did, what did the blind beggar say when Jesus says, what do you want that I should do? He said, and, and then he says, and he says, Lord, see, I think it's important that we recognize him as Lord. And then he says, Lord, that I may receive my sight. Isn't that beautiful this morning? 
He said, I want to receive my sight. And guess what? And Jesus said unto him, remember. He said, he said unto him, receive thy sight. Thy faith have made thee whole. He didn't say, well, you're going to have to wait a little while. Or we're going to have to make sure that you really want to see. Or we have to make sure that you're really repentant, maybe you could say. But, if he, but Jesus says, if somebody sins 70 times, seven a day towards you, we should forgive him. How often? 70 times seven. Do you think, I, I want to bring out, I want to bring out the mercy of Jesus. Do you think that the God that created us would require me and you to forgive our brothers and sisters 70 times seven every day if he wasn't willing to do that too? So you can be forgiven. I mean, if I would ask you how many how many sins you have committed and you were 100% honest, I bet you couldn't come up with 70 times 7 sins in your whole lifetime. Think about it. Your whole life, you wouldn't have 70 times 7 sins that you could probably word. I don't know. Maybe if you were Spike, you could. But, but I, I don't think... I mean, think about it. 70 times 7 a day, I'm going to take inventory of all my sins. You think I could come up with 70 times 7? So there's hope. He said, every day. If Jesus would require that from me and you, then he will do that too. You can be forgiven. Your eyes, spiritual eyes, may see if you ask. If the blind man would have been obedient and get him and, and pressed down and done what he told him, and when they rebuked him, he said, oh, okay, okay, I'll just be quiet. Whatever you say. He would have never got this. He would have never got his eyes open. But Jesus said, Receive thy sight, and thy faith has, has saved thee. And immediately he received his sight and followed him. Oh, you know what? That is, that is really nice that he followed him, glorifying God and all the people. When they saw it, gave praise to God. What does Jesus mean to you? I'm encouraged to realize that Jesus says to forgive 70 times 7 and would not require anything of us that he wouldn't do himself that I think, I think that I can be forgiven. I don't doubt that I am forgiven. I, I don't, you know, when, if we want to partake in communion and we want to eat of that bread and drink of that wine, if we want to do that, we want to make sure that we take inventory. We want to make sure that we have made our, our that we are committed, uh, that we have surrendered our life to him. We want to, and, and let me ask you something, brothers and sisters. If there is sin in your life, which it is, was, was, and if it is, still is, how long are you going to wait to be forgiven? How long? How, and, and once you have decided that it is now, how long does it take for Jesus to do it? Two weeks. Immediately. He, he got it right there, right there on the spot because he asked. You have not because you ask not. Let's, let's turn to uh, Luke chapter 4. This, let, let me, this is what Jesus means to me. Jesus, ta he, he goes to the temple and, he's, and they ask him to, to read the, and, and it says, and there was delivered unto him the book of the prophets Isaiah and when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written. Listen, this is Jesus. This is not me. This is not Elias. This is not us. But this is who Jesus is. And it is important that it enters into our heart who Jesus is in verse 18, it says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because He has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. Gee, I don't care how poor you are. Jesus can reach you. That's Jesus. He said He's anointed to preach the gospel. The gospel is the good news, the forgiveness for all men, that we don't have to be blind and beggars and by the wayside. We can be on the way, not on the side. We can be in the way, we can be on the way, and he is going, he, Jesus, 
Jesus, through his word, you can go get him all by yourself in the closet, driving down the road in the woods or anywhere you want to. You can get him because he said this is his job. This is his, his mercy. This is his responsibility. This is who Jesus is. He is preaching the gospel to the poor. He has sent me. Jesus has been sent to heal. The word heal. The brokenhearted. I know we got problems sometimes. I know we hurt sometimes. And I know we get misused and abused sometimes. But Jesus can heal that broken heart. We don't have to walk sorrowfully with our heads down. We don't have to walk like, like we're defeated. We are victors in Jesus. We have the victory. Jesus is our victory. He, uh, what does Jesus mean to me? He's the healer of the broken hearted. I praise God this morning that I'm not without hope. I know I have been hurt, but I don't focus on the hurt. I know that I have been done wrong to, but I really don't care. I wouldn't trade it for nothing. Amen, brother. I wouldn't trade that for nothing. I went through hard things in life, but my Jesus is a healer of broken hearted. It's not dumb to be broken hearted. It's only dumb when you're broken hearted and don't want the answer when it's so obvious. I, I don't know, maybe the word dumb ain't the right word, but you know what I mean. Talking to my brothers and sisters, not high educated. Uh, I hope you can reach what I'm saying, you know. That's, who, that's what Jesus means to me. He has sent me to heal the broken hearted to preach deliverance to the captive. Have you ever been captive? Have you ever been caught? Have you ever been bound and you, you know, just take it over? You can't overcome it. It's a struggle that I can't over. You know what? Jesus is the answer. He is anointed from God. The Holy Spirit of the Lord is upon him and anointed to deliver you. All you got to do is ask like the blind man. Ask. He says he will deliver. He is a deliverance to the captives and the recovering of sight to the blind. I'm excited about that because I got hope. I know that I ain't got it all figured out, but he said he'll give it to me. That's exciting to me. I like it. And then, and then listen. He is anointed by the Spirit of the Lord, and it is upon Jesus to do this, to set at liberty them that are bruised. You can be free. That's why Jesus came, is to set at liberty you that are bruised. Let me tell you, Jesus, the God that made you, also knows how to deliver you and he knows that when it bruised reed, do you know what a reed is? Is a reed that kind of, it's kind of like a cattail. If it is bruised, it is impossible for that to be healed again. But he says, I suffer not the bruised reed to fall off. That's the power of Jesus. He, he heals it. If you are bruised, he is anointed to heal. This is my Jesus. If there is a smoking flax, if you've ever been born again, it doesn't matter if you've been born again in the past. Where art thou today? Is the flax only barely smoking? He says, I will not suffer the smoking flax to go out. You know, if you find yourself here, you wouldn't be in this church today if you did not have any desire for Jesus. So, yeah, you wouldn't go to a church. Therefore, I say, if you're bruised, if you're broken, if you're captive, if you're hurting, Jesus is the answer. Allow him to bring joy into your life. Because that's what he's anointed to do. I'm sorry. Yeah, amen. 
You know, a smoking flax had a flame once. And when it's smoking, it's not a flame there. Reminds me of somebody that one time was born again. And the flame went out. And there's nothing left but smoke. But you know what Jesus can do? Light it again. How do we get it? Ask like the blind beggar that was by the way. So ask. It is, not, it is not that complicated. It is by faith. It is definitely by faith. I, I, I'm, I'm saying this because, you know, I'm saying this because, you know, I know. I've been that. And I, and, and I, and I recognize that if I have had hurts in my life, if I have captivities in my life, probably my brothers and sisters do too, at times. But then if we can claim what he has been anointed to do, if we can claim that, each person, each individual claim that, then we can go to 1 John chapter 3, and we see here it says, Behold what manner of love. Father has bestowed upon him. Behold, he says, look, wake up. I mean, I mean, man, I, I don't know how you can stay seated in your seats. I don't know. He says, behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. That's because we have been redeemed. That's because we have accepted the deliverer. <laughs> Beloved, he says, therefore we, the world knoweth us not. Don't be so concerned when somebody hates you. Don't be concerned because you know why they hate you? Therefore the world knoweth us not because it knew him not. Now it makes sense to me. Now I don't have to be hurt. They just don't know my Jesus. Are you going to tell them? Are you going to somehow, with a, with a hurting heart for their soul, are you going to tell them? They don't know him. Or are we going to rip their head off? Because we're so mad at them. It's just something for me to think about. I felt already, you know, to grab him by the shloka, you know. But if I think of it this way, I am sorry. I am really sorry for that person. Beloved, you ever you feel that? You, do you feel like Jesus is telling you, beloved? He is calling you beloved. There is nobody in here that Jesus does not love. There is nobody in here that's not worthy to be delivered. There is, uh, can you hear me? There is nobody unworthy. There is not one sin, is it, Spike, big enough that cannot be forgiven. Don't let the devil win this battle that you're in. Saying, yeah, but not me. Oh, yeah, but you too. Just scream out to Jesus and say, have mercy on me. And if he stops on your behalf, which he already did when he was on the cross, he said he will be on that cross and draw all men unto him. So you've been drawn. You're already being drawn. All that, all that it takes is like the blind beggar say, have mercy on me. And then he'll say, what do you want me to do? And then you say, that I may receive my sight. And as soon as you receive your sight, guess what will happen? Some people have, a, there is false teachers out there. There are false people out there that act and pretend that they have had their eyes open, but they're not following Jesus. What do you call that? Deceive. Don't be deceived. Guess who can be deceived? Those that we love the most. They could. Don't let it. That's all I can say. It says, don't, don't let man deceive you. Beloved, now are we the sons of God. Now. Right now. And it does not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. I can't wait sometimes for that day. And every man that has this hope in him, purifies himself 
That's why it's important before we have communion that we purify ourselves. If, if we have this hope, even as He is pure. That's why we, we, we want to be pure. For who's, and, and we could go on and on. And I think um, I better hurry up here and go a little faster here, it seems like, because there's never enough time. Let's, let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. In verse 17, it starts, it says, Now this I declare unto you, I praise you not that ye come together for, not for the better, but for the worse. For first of all, when you come together in the church, I hear that there be divisions among you, and I partly believe it. Is there ever divisions among the church? Shouldn't it? Should it? Why? Why would there ever be any divisions in the church? Here's why. You know, let's see what the Bible, let's see what it says. Verse 19, For there must also be heresies among you, that they which are approved may be made manifest among you. That's why. I guess that's why. I, I wish it wasn't that way, but see, they used to come together, and, and we'll read on here, and when you come together, therefore, in one place, this is not to eat the Lord's Supper, for in eating every one taketh before another his own supper, and one is hungry and another is drunken. You know, they got together and they just drank up all the wine. We don't want to do that when, you know, there's a lot of wine up here, but we just take one cup, you know, because we don't want to get drunk. That, they had chaos going on here, and he put it in order. He said, let's, let's have it in order here. And he says, what, have ye not houses to eat, to drink in, or, or despise ye the church of God, and shame them that are have not? <clears throat> there were some people that were too poor, they couldn't bring any wine, I guess, I guess they all brought their own stuff, and, and those that brought a lot, they ate it all, and well, the rest of them came in, well, you know, it was too bad for them. So he put it in order here, and he said, uh, <clears throat> For I have received of the Lord, that which I have delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he brake it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. This do... In remembrance of me. Jesus the creator that made you and I. Said do this. Do this. In remembrance of me. And, and so I think that's a very good idea to do. And after the same manner also. He took the cup. And when he had supped saying. This cup is the new testament in my blood. Do this. This do ye as often as ye drink it. In remembrance of me. We're doing this. Because he wanted it done this way to remember him thereby. And I will promise you, if you're at home in your house, anywhere, any, any place, and when you drink wine, and you drink the wine in remembrance of what Jesus has done for you, you ain't going to drink too much of it. You ain't going to drink the whole can. I'm just convinced of that. So if we drink wine, it's nothing wrong with drinking wine if we do it in remembrance of him. For as often as ye eat this bread and drink of this cup, ye do show the Lord's death till he come. How long should we do it? Until he comes. Come on, you're allowed to talk. We're, we, don't, we don't have to sit there and not answer, you know. You, you're allowed to literally all together say the same. How long do we have to? Or does he want us to do it? Amen. Till he comes. Ongoing. And, and, you know, it doesn't say how often. I think it's ironic or kind of amusing to me that the Bible doesn't say how often. But I've, hear, I've heard of people getting judged because they didn't do it. They skipped twice and now they're excommunicated. That is unscriptural because the Bible does not say nothing like that. It just says as often as you do it. Doesn't say once, twice, three, fourth. We ain't got no right to add anything to this or to take anything away from it. But I believe that it is good to do it often because we think of him often. I think it's good. But there is nothing written here. How often? Just as often as you do it, do it in remembrance of me. For as often as ye eat this bread and drink of this cup, ye do shew the Lord's death until he come. Wherefore, whosoever, this is really, really important. This is, I think this is probably 
I, it's not the most important thing, but it is very important, late brothers and sisters, and, and all you that are here. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. You don't want that. Even if you're not born again, even if you were an atheist, you don't want that. You don't want to do it. You don't want to do that. But let a man examine himself. Who? The other? Let a man examine. I'll, I'll examine Elias, and then Elias can examine Jordan. Jordan can examine. Is that what it says? It says, let e so, so, so then if it says it, now, now we need to do that. We, while we're listening, we need to think about, let's examine ourselves. That's what he says. Um, verse 28. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. Now, now let, me, let me tell you, if I would examine myself, because for this cause many are weak and sickly among you and many sleep, for if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastised of the Lord that we should not be condemned with the world. Wherefore, my brethren, when ye come together to eat, tarry one for another. And if any man hunger, let him eat at home but that ye come together in condemnation. And the rest, well, I say, he said he'll do the rest when he comes. <clears throat> so, brothers and sisters, now, now, I don't know if it's necessary for me to demonstrate examining myself, but I think I will. Because I think it's really important that we examine ourselves. And if I look at my heart, I know that I want to do what is right. I know that I desire to do what is right, but I also know that I am flesh. And I know that I have to take every thought captive, and I know that I don't always. And I could go on down the line, whatever that is for you, you think about that. Therefore, I know that by myself I am nothing. I am yet but a sinner, redeemed by the blood of Jesus. And if I can remember that, what he done on that cross, what he took that beating for, what he took that crown of thorns upon his head for, when they spit in his face, and when they hung him on that cross, and when they put them nails and he said, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. But guess what they did? They crucified the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Why? Because I just analyzed what I am. I just took inventory of it, and I just examined myself, and I realized that I am but nothing. And then, but then Jesus. When he hung on that cross, it says the rocks rent. I don't know if this is gospel or not, but it's in the book of, uh, it, it's in one of the books that the, when the rock broke, it says in the, in, the, in the New Testament that the rock broke and the cross that he was on, the rock broke and it split right down, and, and the Ark of the Covenant is in the cave underneath there. And it dripped down on the mercy seat. I don't know if that's true or not, but that would be just like my Jesus. That would be just like God to do something like that. Now, I, haven't, and there, I don't have evidence of that. But by myself, I am undone. But when I see what Jesus did and he said, any man that believes shall have everlasting life. So my righteousness is Jesus' righteousness. He gave it to me. And, 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 and I repent. I'm sorry for my undoneness. I really am sorry for my undoneness. I recognize that I am, that I, that I am, my soul is stuck in this flesh. That doesn't give it, I'm not giving it license. I'm not justifying it. I'm only saying that my righteousness is Jesus Christ. When he hung on that cross, that bread that we have here is the broken body. The wine represents the blood. And if I apply that on me, I find myself at peace. That my righteousness, my holiness, that, that we are allowed to be called saints because of him. And this is why we partake. I am forgiven because he said, if you believe in me, he said, 
that I will draw all men unto you. He said that you will in no wise be cast out. He said, uh, he, he said it. And I believe it. Now I have examined myself. And now I realize who Jesus is. That's what Jesus means to me. That's why I, I am worthy to partake. Not because I have made so much. It, uh, listen, if you've been right enough, long enough, you shouldn't partake. You're not ready. If you've been good enough, long enough, that you are now good enough in your eye to partake, don't partake. You should see yourself for who you are and see Jesus for who he is. And, and through him there's forgiveness. And then we can partake. That's why each man, if you examine yourself honestly, you will see garbage. But if then if you examine yourself rightly and you will see Jesus for who he is, be overcome with thankfulness. You will be overwhelmed with thankfulness because that's who my Jesus is. <laughs>